Another exercise that people use for the lats. So you sit on the lat pull down machine, you grab the bar and then you use one arm, you hold in the bar and then you change, you do the other side of the bar. Okay. So this but arm is engaged. When you, when you do arm, you keep this arm straight? You keep this arm slightly bent and the yeah. other one bring it maybe till here. That's not a bad idea. Mm -hmm. So what, I yeah, mean, what do you I, think if, of if, it? If, if I was doing it, I would probably be bothered by the fact that this arm is having to spend energy unproductively just holding that thing in place. You know, but the fact that I'm doing this, what I'm actually doing is I'm, I'm, I'm making this grip on my bar, the pivot. And then the, 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 and then the, 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 the pull down bar is being used as a lever, right? And the resistance is in the middle of the lever. So it's, it's kind of a class three lever, actually, sort of interesting. Um, that's not a bad idea. Um, the, the thing that, that, that would make it imperfect for me and why it would be better to use just a single pulley is because when you do a pull down with one arm, the natural tendency is to bring the shoulder down, bring the shoulder up and turn your body slightly toward the contracting muscle. That's not only the natural movement for the, for the muscle, but it's also the natural movement for the joint. If I'm holding this thing up here, I can't, I'm not free to move my body the way my body would most like to move. And then of course, <laughs> I assume you wanna do the other side. So then you've gotta, you know, hold this arm up. This lad is already tired and you're holding this thing up. So uh, look, if you've got a cable that you're using for your pull downs, you might as well use that same cable with one handle and then take a seat, put a seat farther away and do your one arm pull. I mean, you've already got what you need. There's no reason why you have to compensate and do this compromised version of a one arm pull in with a device that's less than perfect. By the way, the, the one thing I do wanna say about that thing we just talked about is at least it, it prevents your arm from going too high and allows your elbow to come all the way in. The, that is a beneficial thing. You're getting the right range of motion. Unfortunately, you're not able to move your torso the way you, you, wouldn't, you would naturally need to. Okay. All right, let's talk about the upright row still on Google. So upright row exercises the front and middle heads of the deltoids, as well as the trapezius, rhomboids, and even the biceps muscle. Do not lift heavy with this exercise unless you are experienced and trust your shoulder joints. If you're new, to the right uh, upright row, start with the barbell with no weight. <laughs> Look, uh, I'm gonna tear this one apart. And, and, I, and I kind of wish that I had a chalkboard right here that I could show you some things, but that literally makes no sense at all. First of all, does it work the side deltoid? Yes, it does. Not nearly as well as a, as a straight arm side raise, okay? so. If you look at my upper arm, which is great that you, that's all you can see right now is my upper arm, right? You see that my arm is moving laterally, right? If I do an upright row, it's moving laterally, okay? So my upper arm bone joint is doing pretty much the same thing. And the primary difference between the side raise and the upright row is that my arm is bent and it's pulling my shoulder forward. Okay, so if I do an, a straight arm, I'm using a straight arm, which means I'm getting twice the magnification, which means I need half or less than half as much weight to get the same amount of deltoid, side deltoid load that I'd be able to get with an upright row. Okay, so the idea that you're using more weight with an upright row does not mean that you're loading the side deltoid more. It just means that you've reduced its magnification so much that you have to compensate for that reduction of magnification by adding more weight right? That's just inefficient. Okay. Does it work the front deltoid? No, no, zero. I mean, close to zero, right? Why? First of all, opposite position loading, whatever is on the opposite side of resistance is what will be loaded, right? So resistance is gravity. It's pulling down, right? What's up the side deltoid. Where's the front deltoid here? Right. In order for this to be loaded, resistance has to come from back there. It's not coming from the right place. It's not loaded. It's not on the right side of resistance. The only thing that's on the right side of resistance 
if anything, you're getting you're, you're you're pulling your rear delta into it a little bit if you rotate enough. But if you rotate enough, then you're then you're straining the shoulder joint itself. The fact that you're having a weight that's pulling down on your arm and you're having to keep it from because that forearm would go straight vertical if it could. And the reason it's not is because you're trying to keep it from doing that with your infraspinatus. So you're straining your infraspinatus. You're over internally rotating your humerus inside the shoulder joint. You're not getting any front delta at exercise. You're diminishing the amount of magnification. So you're required to use more weight. And, and, and incidentally, as you're doing, you might be shrugging, but you're not shrugging with the same range of motion you would if you were doing a straight shrug. So you're getting an incomplete range of motion. Is the rhomboid working? Well, yeah, the rhomboid works anytime the upper fibers of the trapezius work. But that's not unique to upright rows. That'll happen on dumbbell shrugs, which you could, by the way, do without any shoulder strain, without any infraspinatus strain. So it's just, it's, a, it's, and then not to mention the fact that you got your wrists turning sideways and they're not made to bend sideways to that degree. I don't know anyone who's, you, who's doing an upright row who doesn't say it's not comfortable on my wrists. Right. I mean, if you were doing it, if you were doing it with dumbbells, you, you, you know, your, your hands would change position, but at least, at least you're, you're, you know, you're not limited by a barbell to keep your hands like this. So there's nothing about an upright row. That's good. You, you could, you could, uh, you can knock off. There's five or six things that are bad, straight bad about an upright row. And there's one or two things that are a small percentage of good, but a small percentage of good, meaning that you can get more good, bigger percentage of good with better exercise, without any of that joint strain, without the internal rotation of the humerus, without the infraspinatus strain, without the wrist strain, without using as much weight. Last exercise for today is the side plank on a bench. So your whole weight is on, let's say, if you're using your right arm, yeah. all your weight is on your shoulder and your right foot in an right. awkward way. And then you bring your left knee to, toward your chest back and forth. So that's the, the limb that is moving. That's for the obliques. <laughs> you know, it's funny. When I, when I set out to write this book and to talk about biomechanics, I've always been very careful to not offend anyone. Unfortunately, it's pretty impossible. Right? It's impossible to not have some people be offended when they are shown or it is known that something that they are promoting is not smart. But I always say, look, until biomechanics is learned, until you really understand the physics of resistance exercise, you can be forgiven for teaching ridiculous flat out ridiculous exercises like the one you just described because that is the conventional wisdom that's what is handed down and what ends up happening so often is that a person with good genetics who may or may not be supplementing who does enough right to compensate for the things he's doing wrong meaning wrong being less than totally productive um is that they look good. And so you see them doing this thing and recommending, ah, oh, well, boy, he must know what he's doing because look at him, right? And it's, it's false. Okay, so let me get into the mechanics here. The first thing I'll say is that the oblique muscle, we have internal and external obliques on our sides, right? Internals go one way, externals go another with kind of like a crosshatch, right? The function of that muscle, what does function mean? Function means what movement does it create when that muscle contracts, i.e. shortens, right? It produces two movements or a combination of both. It rotates the torso and it bends the torso. So anytime that we move rotationally or to the side, those muscles are working together, right? So that means that the dynamic motion that oblique contraction would produce would be either a side bend or a torso rotation. That's dynamic exercise, which is always more productive, always more productive. And I'll explain what productive is in just a second. Always more productive than isometric. 
isometric is without movement. Okay, so if you squeeze your hands together like this, you are isometrically contracting your pectoral muscles. There is muscle contraction, yes. There's muscle stimulation in this point of the pectoral's range of motion. That point will get stronger. This point will not. This point will not. This point will not. Yes, there will be some overall strength gain on your pectoral, but a full range of motion produces strength gains throughout the entire range of motion. Isometric creates it most in that one point where you hold it. They've done numerous studies that have shown from a functional standpoint and from a visible standpoint, dynamic exercise is more productive, more beneficial than isometric. So the first problem with a side plank is it's isometric. There's no movement. There's no skeletal movement. There's no elongation or shortening of the muscle. That's problem number one. Problem number two is it's body weight, right? Which means that somehow you have to assume that everybody, everybody's oblique is strong enough to hold their entire body weight. Well, they're not. That's why some people do it you know, on their knee, I guess. But it's like you could do a cable side bend with the exact amount of resistance with movement and get a better result that costs much less effort, right? So that's strike number two. Strike number three is that you're putting this person's entire body weight on their shoulder joint, okay? So in physics, there's this thing called ground reaction force. What that basically means is that the ground pushes back with the same amount of force that you're pushing down with, okay? If you weigh, let's say 150 pounds, your body weight is pushing down on the ground with 150 pounds of force. And whether you realize it or not, the ground is actually pushing back with 150 pounds of force. If it was pushing with less than 150 pounds, you would sink. If it was pushing with more than 150 pounds, you would rise. It's meeting your 150 pounds of force. So let's say you weigh 150 pounds and you, you're suspending yourself on two points, right? You're, you basically got half your body weight on your, on your arm and half your body weight on your ankle, on your, the side of your foot. So, you know, 150 pounds, you got 75 pounds of upward pushing on your arm into the shoulder joint. Now, for a perfectly healthy, young shoulder joint, that's probably not a problem at all. But you have a lot of people being told, being instructed, who are 70 years old, 60 years old, to put 75 pounds of force into their shoulder joint when sometimes they have shoulder problems to begin with, that's not only not wise, not prudent, it's totally unnecessary. There's no reason why you would have to ram your humerus into your shoulder sack, into your socket, in order to work your oblique muscle when you could do it just holding a cable. And a cable, by the way, you wouldn't have to hold 75 pounds. You'd only have to hold, you know, 40 or 50 pounds, if that, because it's perpendicular to your torso, which means you're working at mechanical advantage, which you're working efficiently. So on top of that, you've got this pressure, this upward pushing, this ground reaction force that's pushing up on the side of your foot, okay? And because you're lifting the other leg away, it's only that straight leg that's suspending you. Now, let's just say your leg was a rope, right? What, would, what do you think would happen to that rope if you put, it would collapse. What's keeping your leg from collapsing sideways is the tendons on the sides of your knee. There's no muscle that's doing it. If you were doing a regular plank, the quadricep could be doing it, right? If you're, you know, doing that on your back, the hamstrings, on the side, you have no muscle that's helping you keep that knee from bending sideways. It is 100% tendons that are doing that. Okay, fine if you're young, healthy, strong, right? Not so fine if you're slightly older, if you've had knee problems, if you have arthritis. Not fine at all to apply sideways pressure to your lower leg, which, of course, wants to snap that knee, okay? On top of that, um, you're taking that, and by the way, if you did it with both legs side by side, you could sort of support the other leg with the top leg. But as soon as you pull that top leg away, you've got all of your body weight, well, half of all your body weight 
putting sideways pressure. By the way, you can calculate that, right? So you know you've got 75 pounds on each leg. The distance between your knee and your ankle and the side of your foot is probably about 20 inches. So you're going to take 75 times 20. That's about how much force is pushing sideways on your knee. So you're taking that right leg and you're, you're lifting it in and out, right? Okay. Notice that you're moving your femur at an almost horizontal angle because you are at an almost horizontal angle, right? Which means that the muscle that's causing that action, the hip flexors, are not being opposed by an opposing resistance. If you were upright and you did the same movement, you would have a downward pull of gravity, 100% pulling opposite your upward pulling of your leg. Here you're not getting that, right? So your hip flexor is only getting 5%, 10% of the load of that movement, even though it's producing that movement. As you're doing that, that the fact that you've brought your lower leg on front of you now wants to rotate your leg forward. You're keeping that from happening by using your gluteus medius and minimus. Right, So you may feel a burning sensation on the side of your hip. And you may be thinking, if, especially if you're a woman who wants to reduce the waist of your, oh, that burning sensation is good at spot reducing. Spot reduction does not happen. It's impossible. And the gluteus min minimus and medius are so small and they're so deep, they're actually underneath the gluteus maximus. If you were to peel it, Peel the gluteus maximus away, you would see it, but it's underneath. So even if you if you really made efforts to, to get a good workout for your gluteus medius and minimus, you would not see any change at all. The fat won't go away. The muscle won't get any bigger. It is literally wasted effort to load, directly load your gluteus minimus and medius. Is there a therapeutic benefit? I suppose a little bit. Sure. It's always, you know, good for muscles too, but you can, anytime you do go up and down stairs, your gluteus medius and minimus are working, right? So it's not like those muscles are basically never challenged at all. Right. So it, it, it is, it is an exercise that is just fraught with problems, bad for the shoulder joint, bad for the knee joint, uh, lacking benefit for the oblique muscle, probably overwhelming them too much resistance, not enough movement right? Very little, if any benefit whatsoever to the hip flexors, a little bit of load on the, on the gluteus medius and minimus, but not enough to make any difference. Waste of time and effort. And it's labeled as advanced. Well, see, I, I'm glad you said that. We have, we as a population have this ridiculous notion that if something is difficult, then it must be equally beneficial, right? We think that there's a, what we call commensurate. Commensurate means equal to, a commensurate amount of benefit for the energy cost, right? And that's absolutely not true. Parallel bar dips is a perfect example of that. Parallel bar dips are really, really hard, right? Body weight only, they're really hard, right? Most people can't do 10 full range of motion parallel bar dips, and yet you get half as much load on your triceps as you would with just regular dumbbell tricep extensions on a flat bench. You're loading your chest a little bit, but it's not the right pathway. You're not the right movement for the chest. You're overloading your front deltoids. You know, you'd be better off separating three exercises, front deltoid, triceps, and then you would under, underwhelm, you know, the, 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 the energy deficit. You don't want so much energy deficit with little reward. I mean, everything can be evaluated on a cost-benefit basis. And, and then an exercise like the side plank and parallel bar dips, there are lots of exercises that have very, very low benefit and a very, very high effort requirement. So, but you can't call those advanced thinking that that's going to give me better results. I hope this uh, will help people understand, like explaining the resistance curve and uh, the, uh, uh, what else did we say? In the mechanical video? advantage and mechanical, disadvantage. Yes, this will help. See, here's people. the thing. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing, you know, um, the people that, let's just say there's a hundred people that hear this. A percentage of that hundred, maybe a small percentage will say, that's really interesting. And it makes sense. And I'm going to research it a little more. And so maybe you do a little research on, what do you know? The physics on that is, and you look at some an anatomy chart. What do you know? That is where the origin and the insert. Wow. I learned something. Unfortunately, a big percentage of us say, well, nope, I've got my mind made up. 
This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. I've already, I've already, I've been doing it for 20 years. The person who showed it to me was in incredible shape. And they just close their mind. It doesn't matter how logical it is. They're not curious to look into it a little farther and prove it, right? They just, Arnold did, Arnold Schwarzenegger did this exercise. My doctor told me to do this exercise. You know, it's like, <laughs> look, we're not here to change everybody's mind. We'd like to. We'd like to inform everybody and get everyone to work on more productively, more wisely, more efficiently. We'd like that. But we know that some people will just not do it for the same reason that some people won't change your minds about other things, right? They've got their minds made up and that's what this thing called cognitive dissonance talks about. It's that we, we tend to want to see or hear things that support our pre-existing beliefs and nothing else. If it challenges our pre-existing belief, we don't look at it curiously and go, wow, that's interesting. We usually say, nope. I've got my mind made up. Talk to the hand. <laughs> so um, for those of you that are inclined to say, talk to the hand, please, seriously. We're not trying to blow smoke here. This is just factual, provable, measurable stuff, right? This is common sense when you look at it with an open mind. Please do so.